Um, I'd just get started then. Uh, my name is Robin Getz. I'm actually with uh, Analog Devices. Um, today I'll be talking about the little SDR that we made, uh, primarily targeted education. Um, what I'll be talking about is, you know, the uh, just a little bit about the software support and then doing some dumb little things with it because uh, it, it is kind of a unique device um, at its price point and uh, the performance is actually very good which uh, means you can actually do some interesting things with it. But it does have its downsides and I'll, uh, I'll go over that as well. Um, so in terms of why Analog Devices does this, so Analog Devices is a $5 billion semiconductor company. Uh, we actually make the chips that go inside here so we kind of look at this as a, a valuation platform for some of our devices. We put it in a nice plastic box because we really target this for students, for learning. It's really not meant as a uh, professional software-defined radio platform. That's why we did call it Pluto, uh, because it is the Dorf SDR. Um, so it, is, it captures IQ, it's 12 bits, uh, 65 uh, kilosamples per second to 61.44 megasamples a second, 200 kilohertz to 20 megahertz of uh, signal bandwidth, sends it to a PC over USB 2. And it's, uh, uh, right now it's still at a $99 introductory price. As soon as they are uh, in stock for more than two months, the price will go up to 149 And for people who have ordered them, uh, we have run into some manufacturing issues. Uh, we had a first couple thousand in stock, and they, got, they sold out much faster than we thought they would. So what's inside it? Um, there's basically a 9363, which is kind of the um, a, the, uh a feature down version from the 9361, which is found in a lot of the USRPs, and a uh, Zinc single core 7010, which is, uh, again, it's a FPGA plus single core ARM. And then really it has uh, DDR3, Flash, uh, the USB Phi. So one of the reasons that we did this as well was just to see how small of a design and how slim down of a design that we could do. So um, we basically got things down to uh, 72 parts on the bomb. Uh, that's how actually we can uh, make it relatively cheap. Um, I do have uh, a version not in, so this is a non-functioning version, so there's no point in stealing it. Uh, <laughs> you can have, have pass it around as long as I get it back at the back. Uh, so all of the uh, design is open, the Gerbers are open, the schematics are open, uh, the uh, Allegro files are all posted. Um, it passes FCC and CE tests, and I'll talk about what that really means to us in a second. And it does actually achieve uh, data sheet specs and is uh, compliant to the USB spec in terms of the power that consumes. So when I say uh, passes FCC and CE, what does that mean? Um, to the manufacturer, this is a capture and playback device. It's not a radio. Uh, the end user makes it a radio by passing a waveform through it. And radios need certification. Uh, playback capture devices need to accept interference and not cause interference. So, so in terms of the FCC, who, people who are familiar with that, all we verify is that it, uh, when you blast it with EMI, it doesn't cause problems and it doesn't emit things that it shouldn't. Uh, when you turn it into a radio, when you plug it into GNU radio or into MATLAB or your favorite environment and start uh, pumping waveforms through it, it's up to you to make sure that it doesn't violate your local uh, laws, whatever they may be, because it is very different country to country. Which is why when we ship this, we also include an SMA cable so that if you're doing something at a frequency that you're not sure of, you can uh, actually just tie the receiver to the transmitter and see what kind of uh, imperfections, those kinds of things you can get. Because basically what the FCC says is uh, use good engineering practice. If they find you aren't go using good engineering practice, uh, they will fine you $15,000 a day. And, and I'm sure at each different country, there's a similar kind of thing. Uh, so this is actually the device that's inside, the RF device. So, uh, it, you know, it has LNA, mixers, amplifiers, internal analog filters before the ADCs. Uh, digital half bands and a programmable 128 tap fur, and then there's the FPGA and the, the ARM processor and the USB and all those things. But it has uh, a lot of things in here to actually correct the, uh, the imperfections that were talked about in the last talk. So it actually has like an IQ correction, DC correction, all those kinds of things built right into the chip. And this is what the performance looks like. 
So this is uh, basically connected to uh, $500,000 of test instrumentation. Um, and getting uh, an EVM of minus 46 dB. So uh, it's hard to tell here, but this is actually 64 qualm. And uh, EVM is the measurement of how close the actual dot is to exactly where it should be. And uh, EVM turns out to be about minus, uh, or uh, plus or minus about 0.5%. So it's uh, very, very accurate, both on the receive side and, or sorry, the receive side and the transmit side. Um, it is a learning tool for education. It's, uh, we spec the temp range from basically 10 to 40. Uh, the, the parts that we use in here are uh, 0 to 70, but uh, the oscillator inside has uh, like a, a third order polynomial from 0 to 70. So we specify it from like 10 to 40 because then it's in the linear range and it's easier to correct. Um, the FP, it is just USB 2.0, uh, and the FPGA size is tiny, so we use about 40% uh, of the LUTs, and uh, I think it's about 80% of the, uh, the DSP slices in here. Although we are moving from uh, poly, inside here is a DDS, so if you want to send a tone or do something like that, you can just tell the device to send a tone. You don't actually have to create it in, uh, in your waveform generator and go from there. Um, the software stack is based on IIO, so when you plug this into your laptop, and I'll show this in a second, it shows up as multiple different devices. It shows up as native IIO, which uh, has been talked at various FOSTM talks in the past. It shows up as serial, it shows up as Ethernet, it shows up as mass storage, and you can put this if you uh, brick the device for some reason or put a kernel in here that doesn't boot, it'll recover into DFU mode so that you can uh, then load back the kernel uh, or a, a working kernel. Um, so if I can take this and uh, plug it in and bring a console up. And bring it over to this side. So uh, let me see. And uh, the root password is where... Uh, I am super narcissistic, so the password is always analog. Uh, so it comes up as a USB mass storage device, as a SCSI device, uh, and uh, a, up there at the top was the ACM device, the serial. So what we can do is we can uh, run Kermit, or your favorite uh, um, uh, the serial console, and just tell it to connect to uh, uh, TTY uh, ACM0 and type in the password of analog. Oh. Type in root, analog, and here's the, this actual device here. I can check that by uname minus A, and I can see it's Linux on Pluto. I can cat uh, proc CPU info, cat proc CPU info. And I can see it's a single core zinc. And so I can play with it from there. I can uh, get out of uh, Kermit. I can bring up my uh, filer. And it shows up as a mass storage device. If I want to update the firmware, I just take my firmware file, throw it on here, and then do eject, and then it'll automatically update the firmware. So you don't have to use DFU. There's no special tools to install or anything like that. If I want to find out what's actually running on the device, I can look at the info file, oh, which brings us up over here. So I'll move that over again. And it tells me a little bit about the device as well as where to get started. It tells me that I'm using the latest firmware release, what all the different versions are, what version of U-Boot, um, configuration settings, so this how it comes up on the network. Um, one of the things that you can do as well is uh, connect Wi-Fi dongles to it. So the most uh, popular um, Raspberry Pi Wi-Fi dongles, we can just uh, plug in to the USB piece. We can plug in the battery and it'll boot up and get on the wireless network. And then it can send stream basically anywhere across the internet which is kind of neat, um, as well as wired. 
Ethernet if you're using a wired Ethernet adapter, which supports most of those as well, from the default firmware. Uh, let's see, let's go back to... Okay, so some of these kind of use cases, it'll hook up to your uh, host, and that can be, you know, Linux, Mac, Windows, or embedded Linux. Uh, can connect up to your thumb drive, which is awesome. I actually have one of these. I had to buy it. Um, you know, power from your battery or your uh, USB so or your USB solar power, uh, LAN, and this is just a LAN uh, uh, power adapter for PoE. Uh, you know, Wi-Fi with a car cigarette lighter. And we support all of these kind of use cases in the default uh, image. Uh, one of the things that we don't do that uh, it could be done is you could actually plug in a USB speaker and power it and then, you know, uh, use your FM radio or whatever you wanted to decoder to get uh, direct audio from the Linux side. So uh, one of the, the applications is the IO oscilloscope. Um, that is uh, oh, called OSC. And which is just a small GTK application. Oh, that's up over here. Uh, so it has, uh, it basically lets you play with the super basic pieces of things. Um, so, you know, I can go to FM com the FM comms because it was based on a, a few FMC boards that we had made and change all the receive settings, the transmit settings, the, uh, and it gives you basically access to every different piece of the device. Um, including like the fast lock profiles I was talking about in the, one of the previous talks, like there's the quadrature correction, those kinds of things. Um, and uh, it has, uh, oh, where am I? Too many, uh, there we go. So let me just uh, quit out of here because you can kind of kind of see what it's, what it's trying to do. Um, let me just, Get back to the right slide. So it's also supported by GNU Radio. So let me. S and now uh, this is a, a little demo that I showed at the. Um, GRCon. So this is basically, it has GNU Radio blocks. There's a sync block and a source block. And I can run this. And, oh, here we go. And it shows up Phosphor. Oh. But uh, one of the things that uh, it does is, uh, so on the top block I have an, a TXLO and a, uh, it's receiving at the same frequency as it's transmitting at, because it's at, uh, I put this harmonic, because one of the things inside almost all SDRs is uh, in order to get that least amount of jitter is we like to take the clock, turn it from a sine wave into a square wave. So inside the device itself, the LOs that are running around at one gigahertz or six gigahertz are square waves. And uh, what is something you should probably never do with the square wave is put it into a mixer. <laughs> Because uh, you're going to have all these kind of harmonics. You know, square waves are infinite harmonics of sine waves. So uh, what we can do is we can actually come here and change the uh, harmonic, and we can look at the third harmonic that we're transmitting at. And this is actually what we're transmitting at 3 gigahertz. And th this is not on this device. This is actually the, the same front end is actually on the B200 Mini. That, it'll do kind of the same thing. And the reciprocal is true. So basically, we're transmitting at one, and we are receiving the third harmonic of the transmitter. So I can also transmit at one gig and show you that uh, if I put in basically the third harmonic of the receiver, the third harmonic of the receiver is going to be one gig where I'm transmitting. So I get to receive... When I'm supposed to be receiving at 333 megahertz, I receive at 333, I receive at one gig, 
I receive at the fifth harmonic, the, you know, every odd harmonic, I'll be receiving all of those frequencies all at once. And hopefully I'm close enough that, uh, or the, the signal I'm looking at is actually loud enough. But, uh, oh, so let me come back to the flow graph, hit the stop, and close. So that's uh, GNU Radio. It also supports um, GRQX. Five. There we go. Uh, so GRQX also supports SDR Angel, which for those people who are unfamiliar, is all written in C and C++ uh, cross-platform. It actually uh, works pretty well. Um, supports MATLAB for those people who want to do that. Uh, for us, the most important thing is the textbooks and the content. So if you are an educator, we actually do have textbook material and labs and those kinds of things. Uh, it does run embedded Linux like I showed inside. Um, it has about a two-second boot time, uh, build root, busy box. Uh, there is a button on the case, so if it does get bricked for some reason, doesn't want to boot, you push the button, plug it in, and it'll go into DFU boot mode. Uh, building up the uh, firmware images are pretty, pretty standard, as long as you have all the uh, prerequisites available for you, which are uh, pretty specified on our wiki. Uh, building up the file system, busy box. Uh, adding files. So one of the things we can do right now, if I can turn it this way, is uh, so what I've done is uh, on the default image, uh, um, oh, I have uh, dump 1090. And what I'll do is I'll cross compile that for ARM, transfer it over to the device, and run it directly on the device. So um, I think I've already uh, cross-compiled it. Um, so it's sitting here. I just have to uh, SCP it over. Uh, oh, that's not it. Uh, SCP. Um, dump 1090 to root at 192.168.2.1. And it'll... Oh, there we go. Uh, so now if I... S oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay. So uh, every time you boot the device up, it uh, gets a random key for its SSI or for SSH. And uh, then you have to either remove the key all the time or uh, tell it uh, not to keep track. Um, and that's usually what I do. Yes, and the password again was analog, and then I can SSH to analog, and this is the Pluto, and I can CD into root, and I can see the dump 90, and I can run dump 1090 dash dash net, and it's starting to run here. I can go back to my browser, I can uh, do uh, 192.168.2.1 colon 8080. And uh, there it is, and it's starting to see airplanes. And if I uh, click on it, it'll tell me what the airplane is, just like Dump 1090. So Dump 1090, again, is running on here. The only thing that's going across is actually just uh, Ethernet traffic. And if I'm really concerned about things, I can uh, flip, back whoops, flip back over here, bring up another terminal, and SSH over here again and uh, run top, and I can see that, uh, you know, it's 80% of one core, the only core. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. So I can uh, quit that and quit this. But uh, let's see, Let me get back to here. Uh oh So QRX, MATLAB, oh yeah, I guess it was a little ahead of this. So one of the other things that can be done is, uh, uh, it is very cross-platform. Oh, this didn't turn out very well. Um, it does run on Windows as well. All these things are run on Windows. 
Uh, the docs are available, but like all engineering projects, uh, documentation always needs work. Um, so if you do have questions about stuff, feel free to ask. The uh, support model is all online on uh, ADI's Engineer Zone. Um, it, one of the things you can do is, because this is an OTG device, like we talked about, um, you can actually, there's an auto mounter that's on here. Um, you can run scripts directly from the USB drive. So you plug this in, uh, plug this into the battery, and what it'll start doing is what it'll start running all the run me scripts that you have on here. So it'll come up and it'll start, start blinking and it'll, it'll mount the, the thumb drive and just keep going. So you can um, then rewrite the button uh, daemon to do whatever you want to do, like capture things at this frequency stored onto the mass storage device and then put this into your pocket or backpack and kind of run around while you do your wireless survey and it's only uh, this big. <laughs> Which is, uh, you know, pretty interesting. So like this is the, the default file for the... Um, the input daemon, and you can basically reroute it so that uh, anything you want, you can do, no problem. So one of the things that we did um, was basically just to set up a CW so that you would start broadcasting from the CW, and then we'd use this as a uh, target for our um, angle of arrival type tests and those kinds of things. Uh, the other thing that we did was uh, Cell phone jammers are becoming more popular. Everybody hates, everybody loves to have a cell phone. Nobody likes to listen to everybody else's conversation. But uh, cell phone jammers, you could, there's like, uh, I literally counted about 25 different websites selling cell phone jammers online. Super illegal. Um, <laughs> yeah, super surprising, actually. <laughs> no, this is, this is their description. You know, the handheld selectable cell phone signal jammer and Wi-Fi jammer and GPS jammer. It's, uh, yeah, the website is called jammers.com. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so that's, that's their version of the world. The FCC version of the world says, you do this, you will go to jail. <laughs> because it's, uh, you know, uh, jammers interfere with everybody from law enforcement to uh, 911 calls to these kinds of things. And what's, uh, what's happening is that... Um, there have been some retail stores in the United States that have been found using these because they don't want people to price check Amazon.com when they're in the toy department. <laughs> so uh, you can use this to see where those things go because uh, we actually did uh, buy one of these. We uh, you know, figured out how it worked and are in process of actually just making a jammer detector so that you can, uh, when you don't need to see these signs um, to, uh, to go ahead. So I think uh, this is where I'll probably wrap things up. If anybody does have questions or wants to see it working, um, I think at... No, 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 I was going to say at 4.30, there's the bring your own radio piece. Oh, yeah. I wanted to give a plug for that. Cool, yeah. Do I that at 4.30 or is it... Uh, that's the... No, it's... Um, yeah, five? five? No, it's 4.30 because we have to finish at five. Yeah. Okay, so it's at 4.30, so I'll have this and be playing with it, and if everybody wants to come, you can definitely have a look, so... <laughs> uh, un unfortunately, uh, uh, yeah, I, I didn't have very many, so. The, the other thing, um, a lot of people ask the output power. Uh, we limited, we didn't put an amplifier on here, it only comes out at zero dBm, because we didn't want people doing um, <sighs> dumb things by accident. Uh, so what we do have for people who, who are... Uh, can use good engineering principle is we do have basically a uh, half watt um, little amplifier that'll plug right on here and be powered from USB or any SDR from that matter. And but this has a 2.4 gig soft filter on it, so it doesn't it won't broadcast anything, and that way you don't have to worry about the third harmonics or anything like that. So, but anyway, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. I mean, lots of USB SDRs have the problem with USB latency if you're interested in low latency. So what's the kind of latency you can see in this device? So the, the latency, so Lars could probably talk better, but the latency is probably determined by the, the length of one buffer. Or, so depending upon how many samples you want in a buffer, um, so all this is based on pretty standard infrastructure in terms of, you know, um, the radio device itself is a device. It's connected to a DMA, and then you DMA that into memory. 
and you would get notified when that DMA transaction was complete. Uh, no. No, no. It's without USB. Without USB, yeah. Uh, or without USB. Yeah, yeah. So with, with USB, so what ends up happening is the buffers go into memory from being captured. That happens with DMA. And then uh, from there, it's just pointers get passed around. So the overhead of actually using um, the infrastructure and getting things over USB, the limit is USB. It's not uh, CPU, mem copy, or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, like the other uh, analog I see, it has a separate RX and TX LO. Correct. Is there any way to have a single LO for both? For a user's vector network analyzer? Um, the, uh, yeah, so let me see. I think it was like, does this work here? Yeah, okay. So um, if uh, the, qu the question was, oh, I, I got to go back up, sorry. The question was, uh, in the uh, device, how many LOs are there, and is there any way to tie the LOs together? So in the device, there are two separate LOs. Uh, they can be driven externally, but on this device, uh, there's a transmit SMA and a receive SMA, and these balls on the device are not pinned out. I, don't, I, I think on a device like uh, some of the USB RPs, these would be available for people. We're going to have to wrap it up. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Robin will be here. Like, yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Th thank you.